<laughs> okay. Uh, welcome to this is lecture number two. Uh, BSM. BSM. I don't know what this is. Number two in beyond the standard model. And so we'll continue. So we left it yesterday. Um, we were finishing these building blocks to, to go through the building blocks of the standard model, right? And um, um, so we listed uh, uh, three generations of quarks and leptons. Um, maybe for quickly, I, I'll just uh, recount them. So we have SU3 color, uh, SU2 weak and U1 hypercharge. And we have here so-called messengers, okay? So eight gluons uh, from one to eight, these are gluons. And then here the story gets rearranged because of the Higgs effect. And we get um, W plus minus and Z bosons, and we get a photon. Massless photon. Well, massless, we don't know if it's massless as we said, but it's extremely light. We know that experimentally it's extremely light. Um, so then we, we said, so these are messengers. So this whole bunch, sometimes we call them messengers, but there were comments yesterday that uh, this name is may not be very catchy because um, any, for example, Higgs is also a messenger, mediates uh, interaction uh, of uh, even gravity light, right? We said, um, but okay, anyway, this is traditional. This is what we do. These are messengers of the gauge interactions, the way we call them. Um, and then, then we had matter, okay? Usually, so the messengers are spin one and matter, we, we let's call them spin one half. Okay, so these are quarks and leptons. So a quark, depending whether they are strongly interacting or not, whether they carry color. And what do we also recall is that they come um, be in, in a chiral way. So standard model, namely um, electroweak part of the standard model, this is a chiral chiral theory. Chiral theory means that it, it treats differently, uh, different chiralities, the, the left-handed and right-handed components of fermions, okay? So we, um, so the left-handed component of, of fermions, they come as doublets, right-handed right components of final fermions that we know, the, the, for example, electron as a direct fermion has left-handed component, right-handed component, the other one comes as a singlet under the SU2 group. Or in, as we said, instead of right-handed component, we can use the basis in which everybody is left-handed. Um, and instead we use left-handed antiparticles. So there are three generations. So we had notations introduced. So left-handed quarks doublets, they have uh, generation index, color index I'm not putting explicitly, and they had uh, SU2 index, so SU2 index is alpha. So this is one, two, three generation index. Index. This is um, one and two SU2 index. And so this is a doublet of up and down quarks, left-handed. And then we have right-handed partners. They have right-handed partners. Okay, again, all of them carries uh, a generation index. And we also introduce left-hand doublets. These are left-handed. They have index L, uh, left-handed. Uh, generation index again. Um, and we introduce them as neutrino. And uh, a charged lepton of a given generation. Then um, we have right-hand component of the charge lepton, uh, of course, with generation index. Um, and well, we don't know whether we have right-hand component for neutrino. 
this is under the question mark. Actually, um, the way traditionally we define standard model, the way it was put forward, uh, there was no right-handed neutrino included in the standard model. As, so therefore we can say that standard model uh, as, it, as it was introduced um, has neutrino mass, cannot accommodate neutrino mass, doesn't accommodate neutrino mass. Okay, now neutrino masses are an interesting question, a separate question, I'll come back to them, okay? So this is the this is the matter, and then we have a Higgs uh, particle, a Higgs field. First of all, right, a Higgs doublet, and Higgs doublet has two components. It's because it's a doublet, obviously. Uh, now here we have a choice because depending um, because it's a scalar, we can introduce it depending on what hypercharge we assign. We can introduce it as a doublet or an anti-doublet with the opposite hypercharge. In our notations, we the, of course hypercharge is fixed the moment we write we write down Yukawa couplings of the Higgs to the fermions, right? And so there were Yukawa couplings, uh, Yukawa coupling matrices because we have three by three uh, matrices because we have three generations for each flavor. And um, I think in the yesterday's lecture we chose this notation, we chose this parametrization when Higgs couples to uh, QL bar alpha A, U, R, B, okay? And then of course, correspondingly to the down quark, we have to convert it into an anti-doublet because we need an opposite hypercharge, okay? With alpha, QL alpha, A, D of R, B. And correspondingly, we have the similar story. We have similar story here for charged leptons. Epsilon tensor is SU2 epsilon tensor. Okay, invariant, S2 invariant epsilon tensor. Sorry, this is charged leptons. L new R, this is A and this is B. And here, of course, there's a question mark about neutrinos. Um, if neutrinos have right-handed partners, then neutrinos, of course, can have Yukawa coupling. This is a load by, by, by symmetries of the standard model, sorry. This is all by the symmetries of the standard model. Um, here we have a question mark, as I said, because standard model as it is, uh, as it was put forward, doesn't accommodate right-handed neutrinos. But if they are right handed neutrinos, then first of all, we, of course, we, the, the, the moment we say that we have right handed neutrinos, this means that we have some uh, objects uh, which, uh, written in the right handed basis, can couple to um, leptons in the following, through the following Yukawa interaction. So that's, that's an equivalent statement. Otherwise, if I simply introduce a fermion which doesn't couple to anyone, there is no reason to call it a right-handed neutrino. Uh, there is no reason to call it even a neutrino. Sometimes people call it sterile neutrino or sterile fermion. So, meaning that, so the moment you you, you say that you have introduced right-handed neutrinos, this means that you are writing couplings like that, okay? Okay, so now here is, um, comes another question because you notice immediately that these new R's, they carry their gauge singlets. Gauge singlets. Singlets, in other words, they, they are gauge neutral. Okay, singlet is not a good, good, good word for this. In other words, they carry, let me write it like this. They carry no quantum numbers under the um, gauge symmetries of the standard model. They can carry 
gauge quantum numbers in the extensions of the standard model. Um, that belongs to beyond the standard model physics. However, uh, if I write Yukawa couplings in this way, then there are global charges, global symmetries, which are emergent, okay? So from this structure. So in other words, this structure allows two global symmetries This is a uh, baryon number, you want baryon. So this is baryon number. And a lepton number. Now, the, the, the names uh, speak for themselves. So the you want baryon number is a symmetry under which only quarks trans transform because quarks carry bary baryonic charge because baryons are made out of quarks. So under this symmetry quarks, go into, they change their phases. Correspondingly, anti-quarks go with the minus, with an opposite phase. And the rest is invariant. And there is an asymmetry, which we can call lepton number naturally, because we do exactly the same, but for, for leptons. Lepton number, lepton change with some phase, okay. And the rest is invariant. So obviously, you can see very easily that this Yukawa coupling, this Yukawa coupling, tells us that, of course, the lepton number is picked up by the what whatever we call right-handed neutrino. Okay. Now, actually, there is a very interesting story in general regarding global symmetries, especially when we have gravity. I hope I'll have time to discuss that also in these lectures, but okay, let's be optimistic. Um, but however, so in general, of course, global symmetries are different from gauge symmetries in the sense that you can break them explicitly without any punishment. Okay, so we say, but global symmetries can be explicitly broken. Now, with gauge symmetries, you cannot do that. We discussed this a little bit. There were also questions, remember, about anomalies and this kind of stuff. So in other words, when I'm saying that we can break explicitly global symmetry, this means that usually the theory allows a deformation. You can deform theory in such a way the global symmetry is explicitly broken. And theory doesn't punish you, okay? In other words, you can continuously deform theory and break global symmetry. So you can do it by an arbitrary small amount. With gauge symmetry, that's not possible, actually. It's the explicit breaking of gauge symmetry is an extremely subtle issue. I think, I hope we'll have some glimpse of, glimpses of that, okay? Um, so because you cannot, try attempts to deform theory towards breaking gauge symmetry without changing theory discontinuously. This is very important. For example, remember in the previous lecture we were discussing mass of the photon. So for instance, if you try to give mass to the photon, naively you may think that you are breaking explicitly gauge symmetry, but actually you are not. Instead, what you are doing, you are introducing a new degree of freedom, which was not there before. This is a longitudinal photon. So massless photon carries two polarizations, and massive one carries three. And this new degree of freedom is a discontinuous change of the theory. And this is, is very important to remember. So every time we do some deformation that seemingly violates gauge invariance, A, the theory becomes inconsistent simply, or deformation is discontinuous. So in the case of photon mass, theory is, remains consistent, but the deformation is discontinuous, okay? So, but here, the lepton number we can change, we can break. Uh, for example, lepton and baryon number, we can change, we can deform theory and, and break them explicitly. Actually, it turns out that because of anomaly, because of anomaly, um, only one, combina one combination of lepton and baryon number um, is already broken, okay, within the standard model. So standard model takes care of the breaking of what we call B plus L symmetry. 
So in other words, V plus L is broken in the standard model by anomaly. So the symmetry in which you do simultaneous transformations of baryons and leptons, okay, with the same uh, phase properly normalized. So that symmetry is broken by anomaly. Um, B minus L is not broken by the anomaly. Okay, it's not broken within the standard model. So B, B plus B minus L symmetry remains there. However, for this particular discussion that I want to the comment that I want to make now about neutrino masses, this anomalous breaking of the B plus L symmetry is not so important because it turns out that the effect is still um, at low energies, at, uh, near the vacuum, near vacuum fluctuations, the, the, the amount of breaking is, is almost negligible, okay? It can be extremely important in early universe, okay? This breaking of B plus L because um, it's connected with so-called non-perturbative phenomena and, and which, which get amplified when you have multi-particle backgrounds. Remember yesterday, there were questions about high temperature, et cetera, et cetera. But at low energies, these are, these are not so important. So for example, if we're talking about neutrino masses, um, et, et cetera, um, we, we cannot use really B plus cell anomalous breaking or B plus cell symmetry properly uh, for that purpose. But in general, so now the point is that since lepton number is a, is a global symmetry, you, can, you have no obligation to keep it um, unbroken because standard model can be de continuously deformed and in such a way that lepton number can be broken. And in particular, lepton number can be broken by, so lepton number, let's focus on the lepton number. Of course, it comes, we can always do B minus L and B plus L. Lepton number, U1 L symmetry, so under one L symmetry, right in the neutrino transforms, right? Exponent I alpha nu r, okay? So transform somehow, changes the phase. Now this symmetry can be broken by um, a mass term that you can write for neutrino because since right in neutrino carries no conserved gauge quantum numbers, um, it can have the mass term of its own. We call this type of mass terms Majorana mass terms. So Majorana mass term is Lorentz invariant. You can write it uh, as in form of transpose charge conjugation matrix nu r. So it doesn't require conjugation. It's, it's sufficient to have transpose. This is charge conjugation matrix. Dirac charge conjugation matrix. For example, there is a nice basis in which this C can even become a zero, whatever, but it doesn't matter. So what is important is that we can write down such a mass term for neutrino. Sometimes people call it MR. Okay. And um, this mass term, of course, breaks lepton lambda, obviously. But since, black, since, uh, since uh, lepton number is a, is, a, is a global symmetry, Therefore, it's, it's, there is no guiding principle that forbids this Majorana mass term. In fact, we don't even know what's the magnitude of this Majorana mass term for right-handed neutrino. and could be extremely high, could be of order of the cutoff of the theory, could be ground unification scale, even Planck scale, whatever. And so the question, therefore, of the neutrino mass in the standard model as I said, standard model is defined without right handed neutrinos. So, therefore, call it if you want. You can already call, the, call, call this structure with right handed neutrinos already a first step beyond the standard model, or you can call it a standard model. I leave it, it up to you. But this fact, the, the, the question of the neutrino mass, hangs on the amount, what is MR, and what is the UCA coupling of neutrinos. Okay. So we, the, the question of neutrino mass cannot be answered without knowing these parameters. I know, I think there is some question. 
Okay, so he, here is a good question. So can, can a spinner be simultaneously right-handed and Majorana? The, so as I said, handiness is a matter of in which basis you want to write a spinner. So the spinner, so let's do it properly, okay? Since you're asking this, this question. So let's imagine you have a spinner, Psi, okay? All right? Now, let me make the, to, to make life easy, easiest possible, let's take the spinner to be real. Okay, so I'm starting with the real Majorana spinner, okay? So this spinner has a spinner index. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of notation. So let me call the spinner index, um, okay, let me call it alpha for a moment, okay? Uh, or actually, let me call it something else, not to confuse with the color. So J, let me call it J, okay? So uh, real Majorana spinner. Okay, I'm introducing a real Majorana spinner. So this would be my building block. So I can build everything else from here, okay? Now this spinner, Psi of J, has four real components. Psi one, Psi two, Psi three, Psi four. Okay, four real components. Now I can choose, um, since I'm working with Majorana spinner, it's natural that I'm choosing the Majorana basis for gamma matrices, okay? So the Majorana basis, this, I will choose all gamma matrices to be real or pure imaginary. And so you can go from real or pure imaginary um, by multiplying them by I. So for example, we can choose the, 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 the gammas to be all gamma mu real, okay? Now, once we choose all gamma mu real, you immediately realize that the, so, the, so of course gamma zero and gamma space they must have different hermeticity and so you correspondingly arrange it with different hermeticity so so we are working in this basis and then in this basis we have gamma five okay gamma five in this basis actually is i times uh, gamma zero gamma gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. Okay, so we have gamma five metrics. As you know very well from your, your um, exposure to quantum field theory, gamma five plays a very important role in, um, in, in general, but in particular for spinners. Why? Because gamma five is a Casimir operator because it commutes with all the generators of the Lorentz group, okay? Correspondingly, we can split spinners according to the chirality. Okay, so therefore, now the real four component Majorana spinner doesn't have chirality, okay? So with this four component Majorana spinner, I can write a Majorana invariant by linear. How can I write it? I transpose the spinner and I have to multiply by, by, by charge conjugation, but actually in this basis, charge conjugation is gamma zero itself. You can check it. Okay, so psi transpose gamma zero psi. This is invariant. This is Lorentz invariant. Okay. So correspondingly, now if I have a real Majorana spinner, psi, if I introduce it as real Majorana spinner, I can write down this invariant. And for example, I can write down a master. Majorana mass term, let's call it M. So in this basis. Okay, so now how to go from here to wild spinner with the chirality? Well, in this basis, we can do it. Of course, there's no problem. We have to complexify spinner and do it with chirality. And you can do it by projecting simply. So now I can give chirality plus minus or left, right, doesn't matter. By doing projection with gamma five, acting on a real spinner. Of course, now psi plus, psi plus is a, psi plus is a complex spinner. So of course, now you can arrange this invariant. You can write it in terms of psi plus, psi minus. Okay, and uh, so you can simply write this x y because you know that now because this is a projector, psi is psi plus plus psi minus. Okay, now represent. So here I can just simply take psi transpose gamma zero and I can insert uh, projector square minus projector itself, right? Plus I gamma five over two plus one I minus minus I gamma five over two 
psi and then I can split it in two, right? Okay, so now you can see very easily that because we have a projector here, projector square of the projector is equal to itself, right? Remember, projector has this property that square is itself because it's a projector. So therefore, you can, every time you have a projector at chirality, you can convert it into square and then you can take it through gamma zero. And when it, you do anti-commutation properly with gamma zero, you will see that for the transpose of psi, of course, only one chirality will survive for psi plus, psi minus, psi minus, psi plus. So in that way, you can write gamma Majorana mass term in chiral basis, okay? Or you can write it as real spinner. Does, you, does this answer your question? Yes, it does. My question was whether it was a simultaneous thing, like one spinner is at the same time, both Majorana and right-handed. But if- Yeah, I mean, what it, of course, when you are writing it as a right-handed, as I said, this is now a complex object. This is not Hermitian on its own. You have to add Hermitian conjugate. This is what happens. Psi plus, okay, psi okay. minus, they're Hermitian conjugates of, of each other, complex conjugates of each other. So therefore, when you write it in the chiral basis, chiral spinner is, is no longer Hermitian on its own. It's not real. And therefore you have to add complex conjugate. Okay. So you have to okay, watch okay. that. Thank you. All, all right. Any, any question about this so far? What you said? Okay. I, I don't see any other question. So therefore what I wanted to say is that the, the question of neutrino mass, of course, is intrinsically related with this uh, with these uh, parameters. We cannot answer this question without knowing these parameters, okay? Actually, as I said, usually this, is, this part of the standard model is considered to be beyond the standard model. So, okay. All right, so now we have the structure of the standard model. And then we, uh, we also discussed Higgs, expectation value of the Higgs. And then we said, and we made this remark that because Higgs has expectation value, Okay, which you, in particular you can choose it to put it on uh, arbitrary components, uh, real, and uh, you can always do it by cho choosing the gauge, the expectation value, you can put on arbitrary component. Okay, now, by the way, sometimes, okay, uh, just as this, uh, of course, this is a funny remark in a sense, but sometimes students get confused because they, you, since I, I, I tell you that you can do this by choice. Right, you can put expectation value on the upper component, and um, I plug it here, and I get, for example, the first term will give me mass for an up quark, right? But uh, then, naively, what happens if, if this is a choice? What happens if I put it on lower component or on a superposition of the components? And of course, nothing happens. For example, if I choose it to be on a lower component, what I thought was an up quark, I have to go back and redefine my names, my names of my quarks, and that's it. But always no matter what I do, because this is a symmetry, in any vacuum I choose, physics will be the same. There will be one quark with the mass of an up quark, another quark with and the quantum numbers of up quark, and another quark with quantum numbers of, of down quark and the mass of the down quark, okay? So we cannot change physics by, by choosing um, uh, orientation. And always there will be one massless gauge boson, uh, which will be a photon. Okay, no matter what you do, and one massive, which will to have three massive, and so on. Okay, so therefore, but interesting thing was that now, if since we have this type of coupling, right, uh, with the Higgs, um, ex so we can expand. So we said there are two ways we can parameterize the Higgs as absolute value, okay, the Higgs field, and the the the, the and the vector which labels the orientation orientations of the Higgs. We can, for example, label this by three phases. Um, I don't know what happened. Let's, let's call them beta, doesn't matter. So there are three phases, cosine, alpha, beta, theta, alpha, beta, and the, the absolute value. Now, under the gauge transformation, of course, this is the part that changes. Rho, an absolute value of the Higgs, doesn't change, okay? Because as you can see, rho is simply a, a, a square root from uh, H dagger H, okay? Um, and there is an invariant uh, part, so this is gauge invariant, and 
fluctuations of rho around this vacuum expectation value is precisely what we call a Higgs boson. Okay. So the, the fluctuations of rho around the expectation value. So the, we can write it as, 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 as B plus H fluctuation of H. And uh, this we can simply choose as one zero. Okay, so now if we, if we do this, right? And we plug it in the mass terms for the fermions, as we said, we notice that the, the fermion, which had Yukawa coupling with the Higgs, right? Psi L bar, Psi R, now becomes V plus H, right? And we get the following story. We get a mass for the fermion and coupling with the Higgs, which is again controlled by the mass. Okay, so we can rewrite if we introduce notation M psi, then G psi is M psi divided by V. And actually the Higgs, for example, mediates a scalar force between fermions. And we said this was similar, it's similar to gravity. And we can even define a Newtonian constant of the, of the Higgs field, G Higgs, which will be one over V square, okay? Of course, this new Higgs Newtonian constant would be extremely is extremely stronger than than than, than Newton's Newtonian constant. That one way you can uh, formulate what we call hierarchy problem. Okay, so these are the building blocks of the standard. Well, well I come back to this point. Uh, okay, later. Now, in the standard model, what else is interesting? So, standard model has very interesting non-perturbative sector. Okay, in particular, a sector connected with anomalies. And that break P plus L symmetry. Um, um, there is one more ingredient in the standard model that will later will need as a puzzle. Um, this is uh, breaking of strong CP, strong CP variance in the standard model. I will come back to that later. Okay. So this sort of now we have some view on building blocks of the standard model and degrees of freedom that describe standard model. Okay. Um, are there any questions about this before we, I go to the motivation for the physics beyond the standard model? Okay, Omar uh, raised hand, I think, right? Hi, this is a, a very quick one. It was just about a comment you made about the gauge symmetry not uh, being allowed to have anomalies. So from what you said, what I understood is that the issue with having anomalies anomalies on gauge theory is that, well, from what you said, I think that the issue is that you have the parameter, let's say of the symmetry, depends on the coordinates. So in essence, it is another field, right? So if you have yeah. anomaly, then this is the degree of freedom that gets uh, added to the theory, right? This is the problem. Uh, you cannot have anomalies because your yeah. parameter is itself a, a field, right? That's exactly the point. Yeah. That, that's exactly the point. So absolutely, you, you are absolutely right. Let me let me explain also for, for, for others. So in other words, to, let's make more precise the statement that I made. I didn't say that uh, gauge symmetry was not really allowed to have anomalies. In particular, uh, U1, if you have U1 gauge symmetry, that can be anomalous. Okay. Um, so, but what 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 I said, the, the issue is a little bit subtle. What I said is that if you, for example, in case of U1 gauge symmetry, if you insist on um, anomalous U1 gauge symmetry, what will happen is that the theory will generate mass for the photon. Okay, so for example, if I if I have some U1 gauge symmetry with a gauge field, it, it, there is no, it, there is, it's not possible to have anomaly with respect to this symmetry and to have a massless photon. Okay, um, now, um, so when the mass is generated. Actually, what happens effectively is that anomaly can get canceled be precisely because when we generate the mass, we introduce additional new degree of freedom, okay? So what happens, to be more precise, what happens is that the reason why we don't like anomalies for gauge symmetries because they drastically modify the theory or they make it inconsistent. So if, if we are lucky, then theory is drastically modified and becomes a theory with a cutoff and cutoff can be very low and beyond cutoff, then you don't know what to do and simply theory can become even inconsistent about that. Or um, 
or the anomaly should be canceled. Okay, so that's why we are insisting on anomaly cancellations in gauge theories because in most of the cases, if the if theory is anomalous, then um, then even new, new degrees of freedom are not may not may not even help. But you are absolutely right. So in other words, in general, this is by the way what you are saying is a general statement about trying to explicitly break gauge symmetry. So if we try to explicitly break gauge symmetry, what will happen is that a would-be gauge degree of freedom. Okay, let, let me, it's very tempting. I, I, let me explain it on, on, a, on a U1, a, example of U1, right? Um, so let's say we have U1 and we have a, a, we have a, a gauge field, a mu, and so there is a, some, there is a gauge invariance. Okay, Maxwell. So take Maxwell. So in Maxwell Lagrangian, let's write Maxwell Lagrangian in this way. So we have F mu nu, which is anti-symmetrized derivative. And of course, the, the, the F mu nu is gauge invariant on its own. It's invariant on this transformation. So we have gauge symmetry. Now, what do we have? We have, okay, uh, this is important. This is really important. So let me let me let me invest some time in this, okay? Because this is the absolutely fund fund the gauge symmetries are absolutely fundamental point that we need it one for understanding quantum field theories of spins, especially spins one and higher. So therefore, let me let me answer it in a little bit more details this, this question. Okay, so let's start with Maxwell, right? So we have gauge invariance. So Maxwell equation. Maxwell equation tells you that if I take divergence of this equation, because the left-hand side vanishes, this immediately tells me that the source must be divergence-free, okay? So source must be conserved, all right. So now, suppose you, so now we can count number of degrees of freedom, okay? So naively, it may look, because the vector has four components, you can think naively that, okay, there are four degrees of freedom, but of course, the number of components is not what decides number of degrees of freedom. Um, what decides number of degrees of freedom is how many propagating degrees of freedom are in your theory. What are the equations? Okay, so now here we have gauge redundancy. And because of this gauge redundancy, we can reduce number of degrees of freedom. For example, we can fix the gauge one thing we can do, we can fix the gauge. Now, we can always do this. Why? Because if my field A, let's say I start with the field A prime, if A prime doesn't satisfy this equation, I can always change it to A mu with shifting alpha and plug it back in this equation. And I will get equation that box alpha is equal to the divergence of A mu prime with minus sign. And this is simply an equation with a source. Doesn't matter what this is, I can always choose alpha to satisfy this. So therefore, I can always fix the gauge and reduce number of degrees of freedom by one. Okay, so then what happens? What happens is that there is a residual gauge, gauge invariance. There is a residual gauge invariance because you can now further shift a mu by a mu, let's call it alpha bar, another gauge parameter, without offsetting this relation, provided that alpha bar satisfies um, free equation of a Klein Gordon, free Klein Gordon equation. Now, why is this important? Because with this fixing gauge, the equation of a photon, in other words, the photon equation means that we have photon on shell. It satisfies the equation. The photon that is on shell satisfies the equation doesn't really have three propagating degrees of freedom. Actually, it has one less because we can use freedom of alpha bar to further reduce the number of degrees of freedom. So therefore, photon has two degrees of freedom.
Okay, so what this is very important because what gauge redundancy did, it eliminated the fictitious degrees of freedom because precisely because of this redundancy. Okay, so far we are okay, right? So massless photon, of course, this you know from, from standard QF, QFT classes. Now, imagine you try to break gauge redundancy. Let's see what happens. Okay, so how can I break gauge redundancy? So the lowest order term that I can write without breaking Lorentz invariance, but break gauge redundancy is writing a bilinear term in the vector. Okay, I can write a mass term for the A mu field. Now, because I wrote a mass term, I have deformed the theory, okay? And because I deformed the theory, I, I don't have a, any, any longer right to denote this A mu by the same symbol, because I want to keep distinction between the original theory with mass equals zero and the deformed theory, okay? So therefore, let me denote this deformed theory by tilde, okay? The, ve the vector of a deformed theory by tilde. So this tilde has a name, as we discussed in the previous lecture. This is a Proca field, Proca field. All right. Now, how many degrees of freedom are there? Is, let me write here one half. How many degrees of freedom are there in Proca? Of course, if you think of Proca as a field, Proca itself no longer has the same gauge redundancy. There is no redundancy of changing Proca by a derivative of alpha. Doesn't exist in this theory. And so you may naively think that you have accomplished your goal eliminating gauge redundancy that was there in Maxwell. However, you have to be extremely careful because when, by deforming a theory, you have simultaneously changed the number of degrees of freedom. And therefore, you have to make connection properly. You cannot simply discuss new theory because there's different degrees of freedom. You have to do, we have to do the mapping properly. And so what happens? Now, equation, this equation, of this theory, Proca equation, right? It's similar to Maxwell, but there is an additional term, okay? And now, of course, there is no gauge redundancy, but there is a condition because if I take a, a divergence of this equation, what I will get, I will get a constraint because the first term will vanish again, all right? And the second term will give me a constraint, which we discussed in, uh, I, we mentioned in the previous lecture when we were discussing the possibility of the mass of the photon. So this is Broca constraint. In particular, for example, if, if source is conserved, then this is simply zero. Now, this is one condition. And correspondingly, the Broca field carries three degrees of freedom, okay? And that's it. So there, there is one more degree of freedom than a would-be Maxwell theory carries. So this is Broca. This is Maxwell. This is one more. Who is this degree of freedom? This is longitudinal. This is longitudinal degree of freedom. This is longitudinal photon, which was not there before. Now, because of this, the Proca field, you can write generically as the part that can be, it is transverse. You can just split it into transfer and longitudinal parts plus a longitudinal part, and which you can always write as the derivative of the scalar. Now notice what is happening. What is happening is that the, the, of course there is no gauge redundancy in A tilde, but there is a gauge redundancy among the components because I can shift A nu by derivative and I can simultaneously shift phi with the function alpha. And so the gauge redundancy came back. And this is precisely what, what you said. This is precisely what happened. So what happened is that we tried to deform a theory to eliminate gauge redundancy. But what happened is instead that would be gauge redundancy parameter became a field. So phi became a field. Sometimes we call it a Stuckelberg field, okay? Uh, so phi became a field and continues to maintain the gauge redundancy. Okay, now the, the question therefore becomes, 
whether so now to make the the, the 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 answer so suppose you have a gauge redundant theory and you try to deform a theory in such a way that you break gauge redundancy okay so the question is so what will happen is that your theory will introduce new degrees of freedom because those parameters that were before parameters of gauge redundancy now will become fields stuckelberg fields now the whole question is whether the theory with these new degrees of freedom is consistent or not okay and in most of the cases theory is not consistent there are exceptional situations when these new degrees of freedom continue to maintain consistency of the theory so proca for example proca theory is one example when a deformed theory in which degrees of freedom enter they it's okay it's a healthy theory okay so Proca theory doesn't have any pathology, all right? So that's one example. But in general, the problem is that these new degrees of freedom, they bring trouble. And so that's why it's extremely hard to break gauge redundancy, to try to break gauge redundancy explicitly, okay? All right, does this answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so I, I made this answer a little bit detailed because this is very important. Also, we'll encounter this in, gra in gravitational part and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, Sorry. yes. W one question. So this, yes, is what please, you, yeah, yeah. this is what you meant before saying that the deformation of the theory is not continued. So it's not a, a continuous deformation because a new degree of freedom. Exactly, that's okay. precisely the point, yeah. So in, in a continuous deformation, you can understand it as a, as a parameter having uh a value no, no, that's sure. exactly the point yes okay. that's exactly okay. the point for example a, a scalar theory for example let's confront with with a, with a scalar theory if you have a scalar theory klein gordon for instance right phi let me call it phi okay let me call it something else not to confuse with this phi okay if i call this let's say chi chi is a scalar field and i have lagrangian klein gordon and i have this lagrangian now this Lagrangian propagates one degree of freedom. So one real scalar degree of freedom. There's no, no problem. I can deform this Lagrangian without any punishment. I can deform it by an arbitrary small mass term. And this theory still propagates one degree of freedom. It's a continuous deformation of the theory. So the theory when M goes to zero, Massive theory continuously flows into a massless theory because there is no additional degree of freedom. This is not what is happening in Proca um, because the number of degrees of freedom is discrete. So three plus one cannot flow into two continuously. That's, that's obvious. Of course, what may happen is that this additional degree of freedom may become hidden for an observer. For example, I remember we mentioned mass of the photon. So if photon has a mass, photon has a longitudinal degree of freedom, but this longitudinal degree of freedom may be extremely weakly interacting with our detectors or our sources. And so in that sense, in the limit, the, this new additional degree of freedom may simply decouple, but it's still there. It's just simply, we can have a theory in such a way that our detectors don't pick it up, okay? Um, so, of course, when I'm saying discontinuous, I mean discontinuous in terms of degrees of freedom, not necessarily in terms of measurements by, done by some particular sector of the theory. Okay? Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so let me move to the uh, standard model, back to the puzzles of the standard model, right? And uh, the motivation. Um, so, there is motivation for... Um, For, so we can ask this question, I mean, what is the what is motivation for beyond the standard model physics? Okay, so motivation. For BSM. Um, now, of course, sometimes it's a matter of taste. So and classification of these motivations, and they are sometimes overlapping. Um, so, but let, let, let's take a, a, a tour in, this, in these motivations. Okay, so we can split it into several categories. 
these motivations, why we, we are expecting physics beyond the standard model. Um, now, first thing, first obvious thing, theoretical, at the theoretical level, is that there is gravity. Okay. Now, um, so, so the theory that we have is not really a standard model. So the theory we have is standard model plus general theory of relativity. So gravity, okay? So gravity is there. And since gravity is there and gravity has a scale in it, uh, the question of unification of with uh, the question of unifying with gravity, okay, is a theoretical question. We cannot ignore it. We can ignore gravity at large distances, maybe even at distances all the way up to the Planck length, but we cannot ignore gravity indefinitely. Inevitably, gravity will affect physics of elementary particles in the standard model. So therefore, uh, one question, one theoretical issue is how is the standard model embedded in gravity? So call it as you want. You can have, we can call it embedding in gravity, in gravity, uh, or UV completion of the standard model and so on, okay? Uh, now, there is a theoretical um, question which is not independent from this, which sometimes we call unification principle. So unification. Now, unification is a principle that tells us that uh, um, different, seemingly different forces that we see or forces or matter, um, these, th these represent manifestation of some underlying more fundamental entity, okay? So more fundamental, if you want, you can call it a force. And so why are we taking this principle seriously? Because it worked. For example, we, as, as you can see, right? all the non-gravitational physics, uh, which is experimentally observable, we, ha we have reduced to the structure of the standard model. That, that's a triumph of unification. Okay, I mean, you can also give other examples like electricity and magnetism and so on, or Newton's universal law of gravity. That's also a step towards unification because this is a universality. What Newton is telling us is that simple universal law of gravitation is behind all the structures, planetary orbits, etc. Okay, so unification principle worked. And so we are taking it seriously. Also the previous, pre previous comments from, from here, this is related because since we have gravity and we want to understand what happens at very high energies, does standard model unify with gravity? But even if they do not unify, they somehow should find a way to coexist. I will, of course, when I will discuss gravity in more details, we'll see what are the questions there, okay? Okay, so then what else now? Um, so these are these principles. Then in the standard model, it's on, we have some puzzles, okay? So then we can say puzzles in, the standard model, okay? Now these puzzles, you can classify in, in different ways. Uh, for example, sometimes we call them naturalness problems or naturalness, naturalness puzzles, okay? Um, what else? There is a, um, yeah, so they're also, so the, the puzzles also depend whether we want to consider puzzles at the level of 
uh, laboratory experiments and, and data, data that we have from doing some small fluctuations around the vacuum, or when we put them in the cosmological context, okay? So th some of the puzzles that standard model offers, they become sharper within cosmological context, okay? Some therefore become sharper in cosmological context. Okay. And um, okay, so then there is a, let's see. So then there is, the, of course, then there, there, is a, there is an observational data. Um, for example, observational data, perhaps the sharpest is existence of dark matter in the universe. Example, dark matter. Okay, there is also dark energy. Actually, the story with dark energy is very interesting because the, the, the formulation of gravity that we have actually, uh, this is not appreciated widely, but actually that formulation tells us that dark energy indeed should, should come from physics, physics beyond the standard model. In other words, dark energy should have new degrees of freedom. Uh, let, let's hope that I'll have some time to, to, to discuss this, okay? So there is dark matter. Um, now, of course, strictly speaking, um, dark matter could be accommodated by um, black holes, for instance, or some structures from the standard model. However, when we consider this in the cosmological context, is is exceedingly hard to uh, to to have even sufficient sufficient density of primordial black holes without physics beyond the standard model. So. Even if dark matter is, is coming from black holes, for instance, right? Which per se black holes do not require necessarily physics beyond the standard model. You can make black holes out of ordinary particles or even out of pure gravity. But to the experience shows that to, to accommodate the, the right amount, right density, you do need production of these black holes by some mechanisms that require physics beyond the standard model, okay? So therefore, uh, dark matter is, is really a very strong case for physics beyond the standard model, okay? Um, and um, as I said, they are cosmological. Um, they, they, so, so some of this um, observational data um, actually, so think it the following way, okay? For example, uh, let, let's take baryon asymmetry. Okay, so um, we have this uh, baryon asymmetry, uh, so some questions related with the baryon, baryogenesis in the universe, okay? Um, I mean, question number one is that we are made out of what we call baryons, what we call matter. We don't see any substantial amount of um, antimatter or antibaryons in, the, in, in any observable vicinity of the universe, okay? Uh, also, the number densities or oh, between number of baryons and photons, the ratio is enormous, okay? And um, so this, the, these, are the, these are the puzzles. Now, without, if we ignore cosmology, we could blame this on some initial conditions, okay? So you could say, okay, I don't know, we, are, we have some initial conditions in the universe, and okay, so there is some uh, excess of, 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 of baryons and, and, and excess of photons, so. However, the point is that cosmological observations also indicate that it is really hard to understand uh, properties of our universe without postulating or without accepting um, that universe underwent uh, through a so-called inflationary stage. Of course, these lectures are not about cosmology. Um, I'm not gonna discuss inflation in any details or anything like that. But um, since physics beyond the standard model is, is sensitive to cosmology, I, I have to also mention this. Now, what this inflationary state, again, of course, it's a hypothesis, I mean, but 
um, it, it, as time goes on, it more and more, more, and more crystallizes as a, a really uh, viable framework for, it's not a model. There is no well accepted one model of inflation, it doesn't exist. But as a concept, um, it looks like um, it's very attractive and very promising. So now if we take inflation seriously, then for example, the question of baryon asymmetry becomes very sharp because we can no longer blame it on some initial conditions because inflation, usually what it does because of exponential expansion, inflation makes universe essentially empty. So if there was any pre-existing baryon number or photon number, they would go to, to down essentially to zero unless you do some exotic model building of inflation, which is possible, right? And then you have to restart the universe from zero. And because you have to restart the universe from zero, there is a question of baryon, how you generate baryons, proper number of baryons and photons. Now, the standard model, uh, because of breaking of uh, B plus L symmetry, was thought to have a built in mechanism for baryogenesis. Uh, however, it turns out that the, the parameters of the standard model, is the, the way we understand them today, they are not sufficient for this. And this is very exciting because this means that also bary baryon asymmetry came from physics beyond the standard model. Okay, for example, indication like this. Um, okay, so any questions about these puzzles before, before I go to um, the, uh, now the, now I will discuss in more general, in, in more, more, more precise terms, um, um, so I have to discuss naturalness puzzles. So the way I will structure this now, we'll move next to naturalness puzzles. We'll discuss hierarchy problem. We'll discuss um, strong CP, okay? Um, other issues with the standard models. So, and, uh, but before that, we, I cannot discuss those without giving you some feeling about gravity because gravity is plays a very important role in sharpening those questions. Okay, so the next thing I will move, I will move to the discussion of gravity. But before I'll take questions about this, what I said so far about this motivational part. Okay, I don't see any questions about the motivational part. So therefore, let me move to gravity, discussion of gravity, okay? Okay, gravity. Of course, th this will not be lectures on gravity. What I will try to do, I will try to give enough sufficient information and information from the perspective of a particle physicist about gravity that we will need for understanding, uh, for sharpening certain questions within the standard model, which is extremely important in beyond the standard model physics, okay? So the question that I will start with, by the way, what time is, we still have like 25 minutes, right? Right there. Yeah, no problem. We still okay. Have time. Okay. Thank you. So, what is gravity? The first question I'm asking: What is gravity? Okay. Okay. So gravity starts from Newton, as Galileo and Newton. So Newton. So what Newton is telling us is that um, there is a universal law, law of gravitation. And uh, if you have, let's say two massive objects with masses M1 and M2, um, they interact with a long range interaction, a long range potential. Uh, which is um, one over R, okay? So this long range interaction is attractive 
uh, there is a constant, so-called Newton's constant, that, that governs it, the strength of this interaction. And it depends on the masses. And uh, the, uh, it's inversely proportional to the radius. OK, so this is what Newton is telling us. Now, Newton has no concept of messenger. Although I was told that he knew um, about the, me the mess I mean, he knew that there must be a messenger that like instantaneous interactions do not really make much sense. But as an approximation, having a long range interaction without the message, instantaneous long range interaction, without a time delay messenger is okay. So, however, Newton nevertheless has a messenger, okay? In, in fact, it's, it's, it's ironic, but Newton has messenger even in perfectly well-defined quantum sense, okay? So this will become clear in a moment. So now, the, so Newton, however, uh, you, from Newton directly you can you can get a concept of a field, right? Because you can say I have a let's say a mass m, and uh, this mass uh, creates a Newtonian field around it, okay, phi Newton, all right? And this Newtonian field is given by G Newton times the mass divided by by r. Okay, so this is Newtonian potential, creates Newtonian potential. Uh, now, one over R, uh, you can understand from the Gauss's law. So there is a gravitational flux coming out of a mass, and uh, flux is conserved. Okay, so therefore, the total flux through arbitrary sphere is the same, and so this gives uh, one over R law for the potential or one over R square for the force, okay? And so what happens is that the, the mass M creates a field, field phi of N, and this field acts on another mass. And this is what creates a potential energy. So potential energy of a probe, little m, in the gravitational field created by a source, M. So let's call it a source, and let's call this a probe. All right, and so this is what the potential is, Newtonian potential, okay. All right, and we know that this, is a, this was an extremely successful theory of gravity. In fact, unifying theory, because this uh, simple universal law of gravitation with extraordinary accuracy explains all the planetary or almost I mean, all the planetary orbits, because planets do not move very fast. Okay, now the next step is, however, what we are interested in is Einstein gravity. So the next step is Einstein. Now, Einstein gravity represents a completion, a completion of Newton in two directions. First, relativity. So the fast moving sources. And secondly, Nonlinearities, self gravity, gravitating gravity. Both are, of course, extremely important completions because there are two things that Einstein is telling us. There is a relativistic extension of Newton, okay, completion of Newton, and also this completion allows us to understand self-gravitating gravity. So gravity shines gravity, okay? Gravity gravitates. Um, so electro, in electrodynamics, photon alone without presence of other 
particles and other sources, there is no self self electricity of photon. So in that in this sense, gravity is similar to non abelian gauge theories because in non abelian gauge theories, such as for example QCD, color gluons they shine gluons. Okay, so exactly in the same way, graviton shines other gravitons. So there is a self interaction of gravitons. So for example, you can write this pictorially as graviton graviton scattering, for instance, you can have graviton graviton scattering, and so on. Okay, so now this in this way, Einstein also introduces a notion of, an, of a messenger. Now, what Einstein is, is telling us is that also introduces a geometric. meaning or interpretation to gravity, okay? So what Einstein is telling us is that gravity is a dynamical metric. So gravity is a dynamical So there is a metric tensor and this metric tensor is not some dead universal and constant metric tensor but it it is a field okay now the way i will so i will discuss things that are important from the point of view of a particle physicist okay and from the point of view of particle physicist and this 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 is very important that for the, for the point of view of particle physicist gravity is, for example, fluctuation of a gravitational field around any background, for example, flat Minkowski background, there is a fluctuation of the gravitational field, okay? Now, um, for classical GR, these fluctuations of a gravitational field are simply, you know, the formations of the metric, right? But for a particle physicist perspective, from, from particle physics perspective, these are excitations of graviton. These are excitations of graviton. Now, inevitably, immediately, in, in particle physics interpretation, gravitational field is just simply a bunch of gravitons, okay? So it's other way around. So from particle physicist perspective, the background metric, this is a vacuum, Minkowski, okay? I, I will choose it as Minkowski because of the reasons that I'll discuss later, because that's the only formulation of, if we really want to unify standard model with gravity, for example, if you want to, if you are a practitioner of string theory or whatever, this is the choice, okay? Um, and uh, so there is a vacuum, and then there are a bunch of bunch of particle excitations on top of the vacuum. Very similarly to what the electromagnetic field or the electromagnetic wave is on top of the um, ordinary vacuum, right? The electromagnetic field is a bunch of photons. So gravitational field is a bunch of gravitons. Okay. Now, um, so we will work in the following approximation always. Okay, and that's perfectly sufficient for our purposes. Um, so for us, uh, delta G mu nu, okay, the absolute value. Now notice that in these notations, uh, metric is dimensionless, okay? Um, eta mu nu, of course, is uh, order one, obviously. Eta mu nu is a metric tensor, sorry. I mean, of course, you can choose the signature as you want, mostly plus or mostly minus. But important thing is that this is much less than one. So in other words, um, uh, so this is the picture that we will adopt. Um, so we have an asymptotic vacuum, so the picture. We have asymptotic vacuum. Uh, which is which is flat Minkowski space. 
okay? So this is asymptotic vacuum. And here we have a gravitating body, okay? So there is some gravitating object. Um, gravitating object, gravitating source, source. And here we have, so here we have R infinity um, and we have an asymptotic observer. Uh, we can call her Alice. So this is asymptotic observer, Alice. And um, Alice is also, a, it, Alice is well equipped to be also an S-matrix observer. So Alice can do particle physics experiments. Um, in particular, for example, form this object in a scattering process. Start at t equals minus infinity, form an object and then see what happens in the infinite future, okay? Okay, so we have this asymptotic observer and we have this gravitating object. And now what is happening is that if I approach this gravitating object from infinity, I will notice that the, the departure of the metric, departure of the metric from the, from the flat Minkowski metric will grow, will become larger, closer to the source, okay? Now, of course, the, the, there are issues like gauge dependence, um, because metric is not gauge invariant, of course, metric changes under general covariant uh, coordinate transformations, okay? And things like that. These are all avoidable by proper cho cho choosing of coordinates. So, for simplicity, to, not, to, not to make life complicated for, 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 for ourselves. So I will, we can always, first of all, we can always choose the, the coordinates in which um, um, the, even if there are some, for example, we, we live in the universe um, and on the surface of the earth, obviously there is a gravitational, there is a metric produced by the entire universe. And the metric produced by the entire universe is significant. Uh, actually, is, is, is highly significant, but metric fluctuation produced by the entire universe. However, that's not important if I'm trying to understand gravitational field of the Earth, because I can always go into the clever coordinate system, into clever gauge, in which me and the Earth, this coordinate system is freely falling in the gravitational field produced by the rest of the universe. Okay, so therefore, for, for all the practical purposes, this intuition of the empty space, empty Minkowski space also applies if you have real universe, as long as curvature is small. And that is the case in the real universe. Okay, the curvature is small. All right. Now, so this fluctuation, this small fluctuation, um, we can write it actually, we can, we can introduce notation. We can write it as H menu for a moment. All right, so this is a field. And so the question is, uh, so first, so we want to understand what is the theory of this field, okay? Now we can do in two ways. Oh, sorry, I completely forgot about the break. Why oh, I'm so sorry, I got carried away with the, with the, with the lecture. Uh, so I completely forgot about the break. <clears throat> so now we have this, we have specified the, the story here. So we have a gravitating source or sources. We have asymptotically flat Minkowski space. We have an observer. And this observer is, 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 is uh, trying to understand the effects of the gravitational field produced by these different localized, localized sources. Um, <clears throat> and um, so basically the metric in these uh, notations is a uh, flat Minkowski metric plus a, a small fluctuation uh, of the gravitational field. We call this a weak field regime. So weak field regime. 
so we should not confuse this with uh, so-called weak coupling regime, okay? So weak field uh, regime is, um, as you said, when the fluctuations are uh, small. And, uh, and so this is a field. And so now suppose this observer, Alice, wants to understand what is the theory of that field, okay? Of this H menu. Now this field, so th there are two ways to do that, okay? One is sort of a, a, a ready-made way um, because what Alice can do, Alice can simply linearize Einstein's equations, okay? So there are full nonlinear Einstein's equations. You have seen that those many times, in GR courses of GR. And um, so we have gravity on the left-hand side and um, energy momentum tensor on the right-hand side. And so what Alice can do, Alice can simply linearize this, this theory um, so in this expansion, so expand um, metric around um, flat Minkowski space and keep terms that are linear in H menu. Okay. Or um, Alice can do bottom up. Okay. So top down, let's call it top down. Okay. Top down. Linearize this theory, but they can be bottom up. Um, construct a, an effective theory of. H menu. Now, what is H menu? A field, field, which is massless, and um, has a spin equals to two. It's a tensor field, symmetric. Okay. Construct an effective theory bottom up. So imagine you don't know anything about Einstein gravity. Just try to first write, write down consistent linear theory for H menu and then, then move upwards, okay? By including nonlinearities order by order. Uh, I see a question. Why does the graviton has to have spin two? So that's a very good question, of course. A priori, if you are someone that tries to complete Newtonian gravity um, into uh, a, a theory that mediates force between two energy momentum tensors, okay? Uh, so then you have two choices. So the, the graviton can carry spin two or spin zero, okay? But you are right in asking a question, what if we have no idea about Einstein gravity? So in Einstein gravity, graviton carries spin two because that's, there, are two, there are two possibilities. We'll discuss this, but okay, so in a moment, there are two possibilities to mediate force between energy momentum tensors. Two, the energy momentum tensor is symmetric, okay, and conserved. So to mediate a force between two conserved symmetric energy momentum tensors, there are two options. At the linear level, you can mediate a force using a, a field that has spin zero or spin two. Einstein gravity corresponds to the one that has spin two, okay? But you can ask a question in a more broader sense. So for instance, if you are someone that knows about Newtonian gravity and you are trying to complete Newtonian gravity into let's say a relativistic theory, you can have a, a choice where you simply say, okay, Newtonian field is mediated by a scalar, okay? Um, so that theory was actually was proposed, but it is not phenomenologically viable. We know this because of huge number of precision tests 
that Einstein gravity passes through. Okay, for example, deflection of the starlight by by the by the gravitational field of the sun, and so on. Correction to Mercury perihelion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So by now we are confident that um, uh, Einstein gravity at the linearized level uh, is described by a massless spin two particle. But of course, you are absolutely right. If I'm someone that trying, is trying to construct a, a theory of gravity bottom up, in, I have also to include the possibility that the gravity, graviton may have spin zero, okay? Does this answer your question? It will become more clear when we go to uh, more, 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 um, more uh, detailed discussion. Yes, there is a hand, I see, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it was just like a follow up of this uh, question, which is yeah. uh, the, sure. the spin two, spin zero is because it is is only attractive. That is the reason why? No, that, why? that's one thing that this is attractive, but you couldn't have, I mean, okay, yes, spin zero, that's absolutely correct. Spin zero and spin two, they both mediate attractive force between two conserved energy momentum tensors, okay? That is true, non-relativistic. So you have non-relativistic energy momentum because the, the, the difference is that uh, if, I have a, if I have a spin zero and I want to source it by an energy momentum tensor, then uh, for spin zero, let's call it phi, uh, I, in order to couple it into, in a Poincare invariant way, uh, I, I have to couple it to the trace of the energy momentum tensor, okay? Um, whereas spin two, at the tensor spin two, which we are now considering, couples directly to the, to the tensor. Okay, and it's going to tensor. So now that is correct. Yes. So non pathological spin zero and spin two, they, they both mediate attraction. That's, that's one thing. But what I'm saying is that even before you discover that, if you want a messenger that interacts, that interact that, that creates a force between two energy momentum tensors at the linear level you don't have any other choice it can only be spin zero or it can be spin two okay because energy momentum tensor is conserved and symmetric for example you cannot have uh, spin z spin one because for instance you could ask this why why not spin one spin one could interact with energy momentum tensor for example but spin one has one index. And so it has to interact with the divergence of the energy momentum tensor. But, at the linear, but this divergence is zero because the energy momentum tensor is conserved. So if energy momentum tensor is conserved as it is, uh, spin one is excluded, all right? From, from this consideration, from this consideration. Is, does this answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, so therefore, now the interesting thing, I wanted to mention the interesting. Now, the interesting thing is that the bottom up approach gives also Einstein gravity. So in other words, Einstein gravity, even if we don't know it, okay? But we ask this question, I want to construct a consistent theory of interacting of linear or interacting massless spin two field. The, the answer is Einstein gravity. So Einstein gravity is a unique theory of a massless spin two field, okay? So this is what turns out. Um, so therefore we can start bottom up, bottom up, bottom up. so both, both ways are of course fully valid. The, the top down is a shortcut because we have Einstein terms, so we can just linearize it. But however, simultaneously I will keep both approaches, okay? So if I linearize Einstein tensor, so we get something like this. We get um, the equation. Let me call this linearize Einstein tensor, okay? If we uh, linearize Einstein, okay? Let me call this uh, one uh, half of epsilon mu nu. So the linear tensor, linear, okay? Then with this one half, then I'll put on the other side. By the way, these one half and four pi's at some point, I'll simply rescale them into T mu nu because they, they, they are not terribly informative for this discussion, okay? So what is linearized uh, Einstein tensor, okay? 
So linear Einstein extension contains the following terms. And so it looks complicated, but actually, I, I, I must tell you, it looks a little bit complicated, but, but there is a very well-defined rule how to understand the structure of it, okay? So, so first, this is basically, this is all positive. So it, it, it's linear in H menu, okay? And it's, it contains two derivatives. So it's a two derivative linear in H menu tensor. So what are the options that you can write down? So let me introduce notation. H mu mu is the trace, okay? I will call it simply H without any. I don't understand why this is not writing. Okay, now it does. Then, then the structure of the following form, and don't get scared, it's actually very easy to understand and memorize. There's nothing complicated here. That's one of the beauties of, of, of linearized Einstein, that you can understand it very easily, what is coming from where. And um, okay, what else is there? D alpha, D beta, H alpha, beta. Okay, so this is the structure. So this is the structure of linearized Einstein. Now let's try to understand why, what is this form? Why it is what it is, okay? So because if I would be an, uh, someone that would try to construct Einstein bottom up, of course I would write all these terms because these are all possible terms which have two indices Okay, which are symmetric in the index in the mu nu, and uh, which are um, which are which transform as a symmetric tensor under Poincaré. Okay, why? Because since the linearized equation has to be sourced by t mu nu and t mu nu is symmetric, we need a symmetric tensor. Okay, so uh, a bottom-up person, a physicist, would write all of these terms. The only puzzle here is why precisely these coefficients, okay? So why they are these coefficients, okay? Precisely and not something else. Of course, overall coefficient is not so important, but the relative coefficients are important. Now, the answer is, let me first give you the answer. The answer is that this is the form that guarantees gauge invariance. And because of this gauge invariance, we can remove unwanted degrees of freedom. So any departure from this structure would on one hand affect gauge invariance of the theory. And on the other hand, because of what we already know from the, from the discussion about photon and stuff, would introduce pathological degrees of freedom, okay? Except one exception of if, 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 the, if we want to maintain the field massless, okay? Um, so, so therefore, this is what, how the, the gauge redundancy and um, and absence of pathological degrees of freedom are locked together, okay, in this theory. So what is the gauge redundancy here? This tensor has gauge redundancy under the shift of uh, the, the graviton field, let me call it a graviton field, by a symmetrized derivative of a vector. Okay, now, Xi I don't know what's wrong with my pen, but xi, xi nu is a vector, okay? Arbitrary vector. Move this thing up here. Okay, so now we can check easily that this 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 object is gauge uh, redundant. Okay, let me do it quickly. So the variation of it's, it's always good to some exercise. It just keeps you in, 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 in shape and in frame. Uh, so uh, first of all, the variation of, uh, variation of H would be the trace of this, which would twice uh, divergence of the vector, okay? So variation of uh, the linear, linear tensor would be um, symmetrized derivative. Okay, then would be a menu box twice divergence. 
okay? Then there would be d mu, d alpha, and here we would have d alpha psi nu min plus d nu psi alpha minus d nu, d alpha, uh, d alpha psi mu plus d mu psi alpha plus d mu d nu and the h is twice d alpha psi alpha variation of h and then plus eta mu nu d d beta uh, d alpha psi beta plus d beta psi alpha okay so and we can see that this cancel and we can see that they cancel out right because the, the structure, this gives a box, right? So this first term gives a box of the, uh, uh, of the der symmetrized derivative, cancels with this, this combine with this structure, and they also combine with this structure, okay? So this is zero. And so there is gauge redundancy. Now, what would happen if I would um, instead, uh, the, the re reshuffle the, the coefficients between these terms is that part of the gauge redundancy would materialize in form of physical propagating degrees of freedom. Okay. So now let's uh, let's count the number of degrees of freedom first. Okay, in this theory. So um, because of gauge redundancy, what we can do, we can fix the gauge. For example. We can fix the gauge and useful fix of the gauge is uh, of the following form. Uh, this is sometimes called, called um, harmonic gauge. No, wait a minute. Yeah, sometimes I, I call it the donder, but I, I don't know. I'm not very good in names. Um, anyway, so whatever it is, it's a, it's a very useful gauge, okay? Um, so first of all, we can see that we can fix this gauge always by, so for instance, if I have initial H prime value of the field for which this is not satisfied, we can always choose to take H prime to, to H, which would be H prime plus d mu psi nu plus d nu psi mu, okay? Uh, and for this, what do we get? We get for psi an equation, right? So what would be the equation? The equation would be d mu psi nu, d nu psi mu minus one half of d nu uh, twice d alpha psi alpha. This is uh, the second term here, as you can see, the second term cancels with this and we get box psi nu. Now, which means that even if H prime didn't satisfy this, we can always choose psi nu because psi nu, all, all, all we need is that psi nu satisfies the equation with this source, d mu H prime, u nu minus one half d nu H prime. This is whatever it is, it's just simply some source, you can call it J. And so this is an equation for a vector and a box is a, always invertible. So you can always choose Psi to fix the gauge. Now, so we can fix the gauge. So but using gauge redundancy, using gauge redundancy. Okay, so now watch this. Using gauge redundancy, we can always fix, eliminate certain number degrees of freedom doesn't matter whether field satisfies any equation or not, off shell, okay? So the freedom that we can eliminate is the freedom in a vector, which is four components. So four degrees of freedom, so would be number of degrees of freedom of a, of a symmetric tensor would be 10, and we can eliminate four, and we are left with six. However, notice the following thing, that there is a residual gauge invariance, very similar to what is happening for a photon. We can now have further gauge invariance by 
a new vector, let's call it bar, as long as this vector satisfies harmonic equation. Okay? All right. So we remember this. So therefore, this allows us to eliminate additional four on shell. And so finally, we have six minus four, two. Okay, let me see how are we are doing in time. Uh, so what we can do now, if I take this uh, fixed gauge and I plug it in, 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 in this expression, right? And use, so what, so what is the purpose? The purpose is what I'm doing. I'm just trying to make the equation invertible because box is an invertible, nice invertible operator, but the other tensorial structure is a little bit, is not ter terribly pleasant. So I want to reduce it to something that is nicely invertible, okay? And so this is, what, this, is what I'm, this is what I'm trying to do. Okay, so therefore I'm expressing uh, Okay, so I'm doing this, all right? So therefore, I can apply this relation to these terms. For example, this term would be d mu, uh, d nu, one half of h, one half, right? So the same here, this term will become um, one half d nu, d mu h okay and the two will cancel this term as you can see very um, easily it's okay then this term will become eta mu nu d alpha one half of d beta sorry d alpha h so it's box h and so this will cancel half of this so these are gone and this will cancel half of this. And so effectively we'll get an equation. Equals to, okay, here would have 16 pi t mu nu times the, the Newton's coupling. Okay, but this okay this 16 pi uh, is not so important for this uh, at the moment um, okay so what we can do now we can sorry this is at the menu remember we had this term where is it this one which was half compensated by this um Okay, so what we can do now, we can take the trace of this extra. So let me call this, let me call this uh, tau mu nu, okay, just not to carry around the 16 pi, 16 pi and stuff. And um, we can take the trace. So when we take the trace, we get box h minus twice h, and uh, we get here tau, the trace of tau. Tau is simply the trace of tau, okay? So in this way, um, box H is minus tau, and correspondingly, now we can use this in this expression. Plug it there, and then we get equation which is okay, nicely invert in invertible, which will be okay if I restore again 16 pi g newton, so it will be t mu nu minus one half eta mu nu t. Okay, so this is an equation. So this is an equation for, um, for, for the gravitational field with the source T mu nu in this particular gauge, okay? But regardless of the gauge, the number of physical degrees of freedom on shell, they are two, okay? So the, the, for example, gravitational wave, and you know this, uh, probably you heard it many times, like, like, like electromagnetic wave, uh, propagates two polarizations, okay? Um, and so on. Okay, any questions about what I said so far? Yeah. 
we are going to have a few minutes until the end of the of okay the so so i'll just uh, so i'll just uh, continue for another four minutes right and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah sure absolutely just to just to tell it okay to check the so, time all right so now we have let's summarize so we have expression for a gravitational fluctuation okay uh, which is satisfied by the linear uh, gravitational fluctuation of the of the of the Einstein field. Okay, so now, uh, so there is one one interesting one very important scaling that I want to capture from here before we finish the lecture. Um, now, the the for this consideration, four pi's and stuff they do not matter. What matters is power of Newton's constant and the energy of the source. So now imagine that you have a source, for simplicity, you can take it uh, spherically symmetric, um, with uh, no relativistic, heavy source, sufficient heavy source with mass M, okay? And um, so the corresponding energy momentum tensor has only significant uh, zero, zero component, okay? And which is localized in a, in a in a certain region. Now the thing is that if you are a far away observer, an arbitrary source, you can always approximate this point. Like, of course, this is what we are doing when we are computing Keplerian orbits of planets already in Newtonian theory. We are approximating Earth and the Sun as point-like. Okay, because as long as distance is much larger than the size of the source, we can think of it as point-like. Here you can you can you can choose you can take a source which is simply small or you can simply you can also take a point like source. So this is a delta function in R. Okay, so with this we can derive the new Newtonian potential h zero zero okay com component of Newtonian potential and we'll discover something interesting. Now this is completely straightforward because as you can see the trace is also t zero zero okay. T mu t0 trace t0 and Newtonian component is h0 okay so this is Newtonian this is Newtonian component of the gravitational field and this component satisfies equation which is uh, Laplacian okay Laplacian is uh, Nabla square okay um, with a basically Poisson equation okay so say so Poisson equation with the with a proper coefficient here for pi whatever, but important thing is that this is delta function in R times the mass and times Newton's constant. This is the important part. So what happens is that this, of course, reproduces Einstein the Newtonian gravity. But now watch this carefully. So what we are observing from here is the following thing: that h zero zero, the fluctuation of the metric, scales as uh, M times G Newton in, and of course there is one over R. Now this combination has a dimensionality of length, okay? So we call this a gravitational radius. Now to be completely precise, we call gravitational radius uh, twice this, okay? But okay, these two for this discussion doesn't matter. Okay, of course, you will get proper two if you go to spherical coordinates and, and solve it. But the important thing is that the following that dimension, the, the departure of dimensionless metric from flat Minkowski space is given by gravitational radius of the source because this is characteristics of the source. Okay, it's gravitational radius divided by the distance from the source. So this is telling you that if you want to work in linearized weak field approximation, you better watch that the distance to the source is much larger than the gravitational radius to the source, okay? If that is the case, then we are okay. For example, on the surface of the earth, the gravitational radius of the earth is approximately one centimeter. So gravitational radius of the earth is approximately a centimeter, okay? And we are way farther from the center of the Earth, from the gravitational radius of the Earth on the surface. 
correspondingly, the Earth is much larger than its own gravitational radius. And that's why on the surface of the Earth, Newtonian gravity is extremely weak. Uh, I don't remember the precisely radius of the Earth is what, like um, uh, thousands of kilometers. Okay, let's take for simplicity. So H00 is something like 10 to the minus eight, okay? This gives you an idea why gravity on the surface of the Earth can be treated as a weak field in perturbation. So in other words, weak field expansion of gravity is expansion in the ratio of the gravitational radius of the source to its size. Now, this of course is also a measure, and this is very important and will become important in what is coming, how far is a given source from becoming a black hole? Because as you can see very easily, once the size of a source approaches its own gravitational radius, the departure of fluctuation of the metric fluctuation from the flat metric becomes order one, okay? And so that's, that's the feature of black holeness. So in other words, the source is now close to becoming a black hole, okay? Now, finally, let me, I, I think I'm over time. So maybe I'll stop here. <laughs>